this weekend I was up at Kripalu doing a couple of times a year I do a weekend that's actually applied meditation. It's bringing meditation to the challenges of life. And there were a number of people there with the normal, you know, chronic stressors of life. But a notable number that came with very, very difficult um, losses, impending losses. Uh, One friend, uh, her niece, who was 27 years old, had just died of an overdose and other parents uh, grappling with children's struggle with with drugs, with mental illness. Um, People came, a few of them had been hit really hard by Hurricane Sandy and lost a lot, including one who lost her home that mentioned it. And um, people dealing with divorce, with custody, struggles. And what happened that always happens, and it's because of the power of paying attention, is that by the end of the weekend, I had so many people say, you know, I'm going back home and it's exact same circumstances, and there's more space in my heart and mind for what's going on. You know, just more kindness, more clarity, more of a sense of just being able to take the next step from a place of of you know, intuition and intelligence. And, and I mention this because, first off, bearing witness to people struggling with these very huge things and, and sensing the possibility of, of finding more freedom in the midst is what gives faith. And, um, and for each, you know, the pathway to refuge was that through the weekend, more than they're used to, they were learning to stay with and contact what was going on inside them. So the healing happens when we learn to stay. When we, I I use the words, attend and befriend. And last class, I... Uh, the, the title of the last class was Practical Dharma for Stressful Times. And this class is uh, Dharma for really stressful times. <laughs> it's going to enlarge it a little bit. Um, but really the question is when life is really out of our ha- clearly out of our hands, there's just no way that we can manage, how do we shift from that way that we're addicted to trying to control things anyway, how do we shift from this trying to control our life to responding from presence, staying, coming home? So that's, that'll be the inquiry. The Buddha described our suffering as wanting life different. And the way it expresses itself is this continual reactivity we're in where we're trying to get more pleasantness and push away what's unpleasant and basically manage our moment-to-moment experience. In a way, it's quite rare when we put it all down and there's just a sense of um, letting it all happen. Most of the time there's a sense of an egoic self who's navigating and trying to make it work out. So that's quite natural. And it's interesting to start investigating, so what is it we're trying to control, really? I mean, what, what is it that we're so, that feels like we just have to make sure we're on top of? And when I investigate, what comes up most poignantly is the, the controlling is to avoid the loss that's inevitable, that... I mean, every one of us is in this impermanent, fleeting existence and whether we're facing it or not in the back of our awareness is going, going, gone. That these bodies, these minds, the people we love, it, it's, all, it's all temporary. So there's some existential angst that just says, okay, I can't open to that groundlessness of it's all going, going, gone, it's out of control, it's uncertain, 
And so we try to get certainty. We try to put a stake in that groundlessness and say, I'm here and I'm doing this and by doing this it's going to protect me from that and get more of that. And that gives us a temporary sense of, okay, there's some container around all this, you know, mysterious changing flow of whatever. But of course it's very temporary, so we have to keep trying and controlling and managing. John O'Donohue says that we manage our lives so vigorously so as to cover over this great mystery we're part of. So the managing puts us in a trance. But as I mentioned, this... um, Our psyches have a very hard time with the groundlessness, with not knowing, with the uncertainty. Shinro Suzuki Roshi, great Zen teacher, said that renunciation is not giving up the things of the world, but accepting that they go away. Right? Accepting that they go away, our youth, our world, you know, whatever we're holding on to. <coughs> so it's, again, as I mentioned, it's completely natural that and we're, we're designed to hold on to our lives. And George Carlin puts it this way. He says, I was hi- hitchhiking the other day and a hearse pulled up. <laughs> and I said... No thanks, I'm not going that far. (laughs) That was great. You know, one definition of death is Patrick Henry's second choice, you know. So, so the, it's a given, it's part of our nervous system that rather than accepting an opening and full recognition, you know, this, this changing the joys and the sorrows and just saying, okay, that's just how it is. Um, we're rigged to control, to hold on and to try to create some ground. And we do it by tightening in our body. The tension in your body is in some way these muscles are saying um, something's around the corner that's too much and I need to protect against it. What stops us from really relaxing? Dangerous. Something bad might happen and we won't be prepared. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we tighten our body, and then, of course, we tighten our mind. Our minds, when we're trying to control things, our minds become small and fixated, and there's this incessant inner dialogue that keeps us in that trance of something's wrong or something's going to go wrong. That's our world. And when our world's that way, there's very little space, and there's very little of that aliveness that we explored in the guided meditation. In fact, when we are in control mode, our senses are not wide open. More, the body's tight and the mind is busy. And we're not listening to the sounds of the wind or the rain or the birds or the person really that's talking to us. Not too much gets in. So what we're really exploring is this very primal and deeply ingrained reflex in the face of impermanence, in the face of loss, to keep doing. Having our body hold on tight, our mind churning, our behaviors, we just, we stay busy. And the more stressed, the more it feels busy for most people, unless we're in complete freeze. So this ego activity gives us a sense. When we're doing, we feel a little better than just facing the impermanence because there's some part of us that feels like if we're doing something, there's some control. It gives an illusory sense of control when we keep on doing things. And yet, as as we kind of intuit, when our lives are organized around this kind of fear-based, egoic doing, um, we're in a trance where we really can't sense being. As I mentioned, there's not the senses aren't awake, there's not a quality of in the moment at all. 
And you can check it out if you look at a day where you've been um, stressed and, and trying to control or manage or make it through you'll notice that there were very few moments where there was a sense of savoring where there's a sense of wonder where there's a, a visceral sense of love why? when we're in fear-based egoic doing we're cut off from really the deep qualities of being that are really most our essence that love, that awareness, we're cut off not really cut off but we're not aware of being in touch so one of our challenges is because as I mentioned this is the quickest reflex we have when there's stress is to go into fight, flight and do something versus relax open and try to touch what's here that reflex is very, very quick and the more stressed we are the more quickly we go into defense or aggression so the very moments in our life and I'm bringing us back to what I was saying about some of the people at Kripalu where it's really out of our hands somebody's died, somebody's dying we just got the diagnosis ourselves. our house has been done in our child is, you know, having a major struggle. Now, clearly there's things, practical things we can do and we do the best we can. But on some level, it's out of our hands. And what we most need to do is open to that. Instead, we do the opposite. We get tighter, more busy, more defended, more aggressive, more down on ourselves, more down on others. We go the opposite direction. So the real inquiry is how do we Uh, turn around that conditioning how do we turn towards presence and awareness rather than tighten into fight flight that's really the inquiry we keep encountering over and over again maybe just to clarify one thing that I think comes up a lot which is when I talk about not controlling when I talk about seizing from all the managing I'm not talking about inactivity the process of shifting out of the egoic fight-flight is a process of coming into presence with what's here and then from that presence responding in the Zen tradition they say responding appropriately that the whole path is responding appropriately rather than from an egoic reactivity when we respond appropriately we're responding from our deepest intelligence we're responding from our heart one of my favorite examples of this um, Tom Wolfe wrote uh, in, in, in his book he wrote about in the 1950s these highly trained pilots in the US Air Force and they were set at this li- set for this life death task of flying at the highest altitudes that had ever been attempted uh, before so they were going beyond the earth's denser atmosphere and what they found is that and this is to their horror was that the laws of normal aerodynamics no longer applied out there so all the ways they would normally fly didn't work this is in the right stuff by Tom Wolfe and the plane could skid and, and into a flat spin it was like a cereal bowl he says on wax formica counter and then start tumbling not spinning and diving but tumbling end over end so it was whacked out trying to fly out there and what they would do when it went out of control is they would get frantic and try to stabilize by applying correction after correction this is the pilots and the more furiously they manipulated the controls the wilder the ride would become so then they would start screaming helplessly into the intercom saying you know I've tried X, I've tried Y, I've tried Z what do I do next? and they would be screaming this as they were plunging to their deaths so this tragic drama occurred uh, a number of times until one pile, and this was Chuck Yeager inadvertently struck upon the solution 
So when his plane started tumbling, he got knocked unconscious. He wasn't trying to control anything. <laughs> he just was knocked unconscious. The plane pummeled it towards Earth. When it re-entered the planet's denser atmosphere, um, he came to, and that's when the more um, the classical navigational strategies could be reemployed. And he, you know, steadied the craft and he landed safely. So he discovered the one life-saving response the only life-saving response you could do, and it's don't do anything. You take your hands off the controls. This is Wolf. He says, it's the only choice you have, and it counters all training and even basic survival instincts, but it works. So, I'd like to say the same goes in uh, spiritual life, which is that when things feel like they are totally out of control, let them be. We take the hands off the control. All our normal strategies of fight-flight will only, like those frantic pilots, mostly our strategies take place in this spinning of our mind that is trying to battle against how it is, that's trying to solve it, to fix it, to make it go away. When it's out of control, take the hands off the controls. Now, you don't do what Chuck Yeager did necessarily. It's not getting knocked unconscious. It's actually coming into consciousness like, okay, what's going on in this moment and now this moment and this moment? It takes courage. Because as I mentioned, trying to control things gives us a sense that maybe we're going to be on top of it. But it's a false sense. In fact, the only refuge in those moments is to take the hands off the controls, come into presence, and then, as we really inhabit presence, there will be an intuitive way to respond to our world that most serves. If I had you take some time to reflect on different uh, situations in your life, you would know the difference between the egoic doing that occupies the swaths of time where we're really tense and tight and on our way somewhere and trying to get things done and trying to get other people to do things a certain way and there's just a tightness. We know the difference between that and the moments where there's some sense of what's called being in the zone where it's not so much of a self-doing, it's kind of we are responding and engaged with the, with the currents. And, um, you know, we're, there's a sensitivity and a sense that, that the universe is doing it. It's, we're being guided in some way. Yet, as most of us know, the egoic activity is what's most familiar uh, we get some satisfaction. It's temporary. This is the thing with false refuges, is you do get a little bit of a, a benefit so it keeps you hooked. Like, we cross things off the list and we get a temporary sense of relief that lasts about 2.7 seconds and then back we are to the next thing on the list. But there's a sense of, well, I'm, this, I'm doing this as I want to get my way. And we get our way and that feels like a success, although... Um, we've won the battle and lost the war when we get our, when we get our way with other people. Um, we might, you know, get the temporary benefit of feeling like we've we've prepared or defended against an attack or some damage. You know, we might we might feel like we we you know our while got us through some terrible circumstances. My favorite uh, damage control story is of a, a young man working in a supermarket. Some of you might remember, he's in the produce section and this older guy says he wants to buy a half a head of lettuce. So the guy goes into um, the back room and he says to his manager, you know, some jerk wants to buy a half a head of lettuce. And then he realizes the guy's standing right behind him. And he said, and this gentleman kindly is offered to buy the other half. (laughs) (laughs) So... The man- this is, so the manager's pretty impressed. Uh, later on in the day, he finds this employee and he says, you know, I really like the way you handled that. You know, this is, that, was, that was pretty cool. I was impressed. Uh, the way you got yourself out of that situation. We like people who think on their feet. Where are you from, son? The young man says, from Canada. Um, 
Why'd you leave Canada? The manager says, well, the young guy replies, there's nothing but whores and hockey players up there. (laughs) Really, said the manager. My wife is from Canada. (laughs) Really, who did she play for? (laughs) (laughs) So... There, you know, we get certain um, benefits from having an ego that's that's quick on its feet, so to speak. <laughs> the truth is that we will continue, and, and and as we all know, having an ego that's a a well-functioning ego is part of the equipment we need to survive on planet Earth. The question is, are we identified with it? Do we know how to draw on who we are that's beyond the ego? And we will only begin to step out of the unwholesome, egoic doing when we recognize the suffering that's there. When we start to really get how much our obsessive thinking is keeping us from connecting with ourselves or connecting with others. When we get how our blaming is creating separation when we get how our, our defensiveness is stopping us from really discovering something that might be true. Um, we begin to open up. And there are some zones that can become very clear when we're in control mode and realize this is really causing pain. Uh, One of them is, you know, we start recognizing how we are in some way trying to control our our experience of another person dying of our own, or of our own mortality. I remember one woman that I was in touch with, and I wrote about this in True Refuge, um, was struggling and fighting valiantly to keep her husband alive. They had tried everything. And he was clearly dying. But when he mentioned it to her, her response that particular day was, oh, darling, don't talk about that right now. You're having a good day. After she said that she felt this big gap between them, she realized she had created distance in her denial. And her prayer was to please let me be present with what's true, let me just love him through this, not deny what's happening. So that's a form of control, is, is denying the pain that's here, denying the loss, not being willing to, to name it or say it. And we, we start seeing that, or perhaps our way of, of dealing with mortality is anger or bargaining or any of the classic ways that we try to um, stay in charge we start noticing that and realize that we're losing a precious opportunity to be more intimate with ourselves or a loved one. Another way that it might become apparent is if we're fighting aging, because we'll lose, I promise. (laughs) Um, But we can see it, that there's a, a sense of the insult of aging and feeling beleaguered by it and struggling to try to keep your body, your mind, your way of being looking a different than it is and in some level sensing something's wrong. Okay, that's the control, this judging and striving. And um, there can be a sense of that is getting in the way of living the moment. We can see it not as clearly when there's controlling addictive behavior. It's like, well, I've got to control this. This It's going to do me in. I see it a lot with overeating. And yet the control mechanism is usually self-blame, our punishment, our restriction, which I found always leads to fuel more addiction. Controlling only temporarily gives us a sense that something's working. It backfires and see it with controlling difficult emotions uh, in, 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 our, in, our, in our hearts that we either deny that we're suffering or we in some way try to fix it, try to make it go away, rather than just be with, put, take the hands off the controls. 
Now, one of the big places we go into trance is controlling each other. And that is the place that often needs the most attention. Can we stop expecting others to be the way we want them to be? Can we stop um, trying to make others cooperate with our idea of how they should behave? So we begin to see the ego strategies of how we withdraw our affections or we threaten or we punish and get the suffering. This is getting in the way of intimacy. These lives are short. You can see it with partners, the rules we have, and parents, the way they use, uh, you know, guilt to um, try to create a certain behavior and how it backfires into resentment. One uh, little girl was sitting in the, watching her mother do the dishes at the kitchen sink and she suddenly noticed her mother had several strands of white hair sticking out in contrast to her brunette head. She looked at her mom and inquisitively asked, why are some of your hairs mo- white, mom? And her mother replied, well, every time that you do something wrong and make me cry or unhappy, one of my hairs turns white. <laughs> little girl thought about this revelation for a while and said, Mommy, how come all of Grandma's hairs are white? <laughs> so controlling others. And it's, it's fun, but we know that we do that. And we also do a lot of controlling because we present ourselves and talk and act in a way to get other people to respond to us in a certain way. That's controlling. We're trying to control others' impressions of us. I heard a story about a guy who had scraped another car in a parking lot and he, others see him get out and write a note and he leaves it on the windshield and when the note was opened up it said, I scratched your car while pulling out. People think I'm leaving my phone number. I'm not. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so the controlling to get make an impression... Um, And we know it doesn't work. It doesn't work in between individuals. It doesn't work when you try to control an ethnicity or a race or a country. I remember a few years ago in China, there was the news that uh, China was trying to tell the Tibet's lamas to obtain permission before they reincarnate. (laughs) I mean, what kind of law would that be? I mean, think about it. Think about it. you're a llama and you're about to reincarnate. Whoops, gotta go, gotta go get that form filled out. <laughs> you know, it's pretty wild. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So the control and 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 I'm thinking right now. I'm reading a book that's quite beautiful on uh, the condition of our earth and how the human ego's attempts at a fear and greed to control this earth to get all the resources for, to meet our needs for ever-increasing consumption, what that's done, the pollution, the destruction of the habitat. Ego-based control causes harm. Fight-flight causes harm. And part of the control is to deny that it's actually happening to this earth, that the that the global warming does not indicate anything. So again, controlling takes a lot of different forms. Um, And just to, I'll just end this piece of this talk by saying, we bring it into spiritual practice. The ego becomes a spiritual ego and it co-ops spiritual practice. So spiritual practice becomes yet another instrument of the ego to try to control the self into being a more perfect self and a more spiritual self. And we have standards that we're trying to meet in spiritual life of I'm having this kind of a good meditation and I'm a generous or open or patient person. And again, there's this monitoring and there's still that sense of an ego trying to make something happen. Okay? We do it a lot with our minds. There's a a way in which in spiritual life we're trying to figure things out so we have control by having the knowledge of how it all is. And as you know, concepts, spiritual concepts, end up being a veil that covers over this 
mystery that's beyond words. Some of you might remember that great story of a, 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 a new novice Zen, uh, Zen practitioner goes up to this great monk and says, what happens after we die? And he says, I don't know. And then he's very disappointed. He says, I thought you were a Zen monk. And the response was, I am, but not a dead one. You know? 